Um, <laughs> this is called Sleeping Strangers. I wrote it. And Roger's gonna hold my beer. Very nice of him. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're not drinking my beer. In September of 2008, I set off on a cross-country train excursion equipped with a month-long Amtrak unlimited ride pass, plenty of whiskey, and a bottle of Benadryl. The latter two, when combined, make for a powerful sedative, which proved invaluable during overnight train trips. My manner of travel was clear from the beginning, but my housing along the way was not. At the recommendation of a friend, I signed up for Couchsurfing.com, a sort of social network for vagabonds in the market for a free place to stay. On paper, the premise is a simple one. People offer couches and other people accept the offer, the vagrants paying no more than a customary drink for their most honor. In practice, the system brings all sorts of strange features into contact with one another. Loners, freaks, the hypersocial, the overwhelmed, and the downright dangerous. Setting out from San Francisco, I jammed down to LA, east to the fierce heat of Tucson, through to Austin, then rested in New Orleans at the residence of a tiny gun toting blonde, all without a hitch in the couch surfing system. After a stop in Raleigh, North Carolina, I made my way to New York, then was on to Boston and Washington, D.C., then to Indiana, where an old college professor of mine gave me shelter. After a stop in Minneapolis, I hit the rails again toward Fargo, North Dakota, not, about, not out of any particular curiosity at the time, but because I simply needed to break up the train ride back west into manageable segments. Unless you have the privilege of a private cabin, 40 hours is far too long to spend in a tin can, even if you have access to drugs. <laughs> My host in Fargo, Julia, graciously offered to pick me up around 5 a.m. since she was awake that early for work anyway. After arriving at 3.30 a.m., I patiently waited in the station and shooed the bat with the attendant, the only other human there. 5.30 came and went. And what do you do for a living? The attendant asked. 6 came and went. Where are you coming from? 6.30 came and went. Can I call a cab for you? I wasn't sure if there were any cabs in Fargo. I could tell he wanted to say it. Don't worry, son. She'll be here. At about seven, the train door, the station door swung violently open, and a woman stepped in to fill the frame. I'm here, she yelled. It could only be Julia, nearly six feet of her, with hair frizzed out six inches in any given direction, sporting a bizarre getup and wearing massive snow boots in September, a snowless month. <laughs> I'll never forget the look on the station tenant's face. He seemed to back up slowly, feeling behind him and eyeing me for answers. I had nothing for him, so I bade him farewell. As Julie and I piled into her car, she explained her tardiness, which I was inclined to forgive, considering her otherwise general graciousness. Her excuse was simple, really. She had passed out drunk. <laughs> In fact, she was still quite drunk. But luckily, luckily the streets were empty. She was fairly, a fairly talented drunk driver, so we reached her apartment without rest. Mom hates that part of the story, she's here. That didn't happen, Mom. It didn't happen. Uh, once inside, Julie showed me to the couch and announced that I needed a nightlight. A what? I asked. A nightlight. But the sun's coming up, I said. Well, just in case. She ran a riot around her apartment for five minutes, digging through piles of clothes and artwork and video cassettes. Eventually settling on a two-foot glowing Santa, she then spent another five minutes searching for an available outlet. I, meanwhile, fumbled for Benadryl and swallowed enough to melt my liver. She finally got the Santa lit and placed it in the middle of the room. There she yelled, good night. I woke at 2 p.m. with an antihistamine hangover. In the full light of day, I took note of what I was in. It wasn't immediately clear, perhaps part art gallery, part residence, and part thrift store, all mixed up into one befuddling domicile. Some sort of postmodern sculpture, just a jumble of wire, was hanging from the ceiling, and there was an extra door in the corner, which may or may not have been a gateway to another dimension. <laughs> Over the next few days, Julie and I adventured around Fargo, climbing over trains and rail yards and watching a succession of Paul Newman movies, through which she talked incessantly. <laughs> Paul had recently died, and she was grieving in the only way she knew how, by piling popcorn into her face and providing comprehensive narration. <laughs> I came to learn the following facts about Julia. She once thought she lost the cotton from a Q-tip in her ear. 
<laughs> After a consultation with her doctor, she apparently has not. <laughs> She recently destroyed her cell phone with her car by repeatedly, repeatedly slamming the trunk on it. The trunk just wouldn't shut, she explained. <laughs> she cannot simultaneously ride a bike and wave to a friend at the same time. <laughs> because she will crash into a pole. This I was a witness to. The noise coming from the right rear wheel of her car isn't a problem. She still has three good wheels left, which all go very nicely. <laughs> Upon our first meeting, as she barreled through the train station door like a rum soap pirate, I was admittedly terrified by Julia. Her apartment's clutter, her aloofness quickly transitioning to mania, the pile of dishes and the attached fruit fly colonies, all terrifying. In two days, I amassed a dozen panic attacks. It wasn't until I was halfway through Montana on a lightly populated train that I began to appreciate the woman. Few people work at a retirement home and have an impulse to buy every hockey stick they come across. <laughs> she never even played the game. And I was stuck on a train with the typicals, the exhausted retired, the middle American families, the vapid frat boys. None of them were wearing snow boots, everybody's hair was entirely rational, and no one was falling off bicycles. I drank a lot of whiskey and took some Benadryl to see if that would help, and it did in a way. The old man next to me got slightly more entertaining, and I could have sworn he was talking about tracking criminals by their footprints in the snow, which is pretty hardcore, <laughs> though that could have been the chemical stuff. He fell asleep, then I did as well, and I could have sworn I dreamt about blowing sand and falling off bicycles, but that could have just been the chemical stuff. 